Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. I got everyone. How are you going? Phil Tarrant here, co-host of Investing Insights with the Right Property Group, and there is a right in Right Property Group. The right men on the ground always. Directors Steve Waters, Victor Kumar, gents. How's it going? Do you know I look forward to this every it's month. Fun. I just want to hear what the introduction is. Yep. Every yep. single time. I'm here just for the free coffee. <laughs> he no, puts the right nothing in the right is property free, group. Victor. There's a lot of wrong. There's a lot of wrong in the right property group, and most of it is you, Steve Waters. Uh, luckily, we have Victor here who. Uh, a lot of people might not know this. What's the backstory with you guys? Let's start there because we talk about wrong and right, yin and yang, two different people from different uh, <laughs> uh, from two different experiences coming together to forge a pathway which is adding a lot of value to property investors. What's the backstory for those that don't know? The backstory. The backstreet story. You backstreet, backstreet boys. boys? <laughs> <laughs> no. So we met a long time ago at auctions. That's right. Essentially. Just after the GFC, really. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry, it was, it was during, 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 yeah, during the GFC. Yeah, yeah. So I was at auctions almost daily during the GFC and uh, Vic happened to turn up to one of the auctions or a day of auctions it was mm-hmm. and we started to pull the pin at the same price. And I thought, oh, this, this guy This might, bloke seems to know what he's doing. He seems to know what he's doing. I'll have to change my approach, mm. so to speak. So I threw a brick at him and I didn't. <laughs> it, uh, and we just got talking and then true to Victor's style, he said, yeah, do you want to go out for lunch? I said, sure, of which he made me pay. <laughs> at Hungry Jacks. At Hungry Jacks. He went next <laughs> at level. At least you know Victor always gets best price on properties. It is the reason well, why. Yeah. <laughs> Can't get the whopper. It, um, and that was basically it. And oh, no, then you said, oh, look, can you go? F- I think you wanted me to find you a property, I think it was. And I said, well, you know what you're doing. You can do that yourself. Yeah, a little bit of testing. And, 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 yeah. um, and then that was it. And we sort of just started to hang out and we bought the two businesses together. Mm. Yeah, it's it's um. Is there any, how many sort of clients would have had over the years right now, including myself? There'd be hundreds, thousands. No, we've got one troublesome client, our la Phil Tarrant, <laughs> but the rest are really good. <laughs> trying to sack him for like how many years <laughs> now? Right? right? It's hard. It's like a bad smell. You just can't just, get rid of it, Steve. You know about it's that, like wouldn't a you? Bad scholar. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the question? How many properties? Have yeah, we, how long? No, no, how many sort of? I've never really thought about it. It's only just sort of kicking this off. How many? Australians you would have supported into sort of investing? There'd just be, there'd be a It's long. a good question. Yeah. I've, I've, I've really actually lost count, actually. Oh, yeah. There's some homework well, for you guys. Come yeah. back and tell me next time. Do you know what? There's nothing time. really that I've never thought about. Mm, it. Thought yeah. about it, never really used that as a marketing PC. That mm. It just doesn't – the quantity isn't relevant. Yeah. It's just what we do and we, we happen to enjoy it. Hmm. Oh, there you go. That's a bit of a backstory. So I thought it would have been a little bit more entertaining that, you know, a couple of blokes in the GFC sort of fighting over the same properties. Well, it was. On that day, it was. Yeah. Yeah. It, mm. um, and there's a bigger story of that, which we'll maybe – we can't, we, we can't yeah, really say that. So, so would you guys like to go back in time? Would you do anything different, like from a like when you were buying in the GFC? And I sort of frame it in relation to where we are right now. We're in a market with flux. A lot of people in the GFC put their heads in their hands and went, the sky's falling in, everything's going to go, same thing happened. There's a lot of parallels, right? We've spoken about it over the, the last couple of uh, months on Investing Insights for Right Property Group. But going back to the GFC, what would you have done differently knowing what you know now? Gone harder. Bu- buying in, in a market that you can control as yeah, in where you can right now. Gone harder. And I know probably everybody on the face mm-hmm. of the earth during that time would say the same thing, but mm. it's the truth. Yeah, It would have been, as long as we're controlling the cash flow yeah. at the same time as investors, but it would have been buying anything that we could that made sense times 10, mm. essentially. So why yeah. didn't you go so hard? Because you sort of had a set of parameters that you wouldn't deviate from. And, and the fact that you can actually look in hindsight and say, I wish it went harder when I did means that what you said no to has been a positive impact to your portfolio because, and also the business because you'd be able to sit here now going, hey, things have worked out. Well, personally, you can only buy so much mm. like because the banks will only give you so much and you operate within your own capacities and thresholds and as we do with the clients. So it's you need to take a very methodical approach, if you will. Hindsight is excellent. We can say, well, we should have bought 10,000 properties during mm. that time. But when you're in that moment in time, you still – when you do have a market and an economy in flux, a worldwide economy in flux, you need to be methodical and take it one step at a time and not 
throw too much caution to the wind. You can only throw caution to the wind retrospectively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you don't want to be in a situation where you ask the question right now and we say, I wish we hadn't gone as hard, mm. right? Because mm. um, that does happen. You probably wouldn't be standing here saying that yeah, if that was that. the case, yeah, right? True that, yeah. You know, but it does happen in real life, right? Where people become too buoyant or too exuberant about buying and acquiring and they start purchasing for the sake of purchasing. Yeah. Every property needs to have a place and a strategy within the overall strategy within the portfolio. And it needs to resonate with how finances is panning out at that point in time, how your employment, in other words, the income that you're deriving is panning out, and also your holding cost and the predictable upheavals that any portfolio will have. It's interesting you say that because if you go back to the GFC and taking your question into account as well, what would you have done different when we say buy more? It's what we went through then, and we did buy hmm. probably a couple of thousand properties during the GFC yeah, absolutely and just after it, yeah. and that's across Australia too. But if we fast forward to now, and even let's say four months ago, five months ago, April, when, mm-hmm. when all this started to roll out around COVID, there was a few predictables in there for us mm. because we did go through the GFC and we did we were methodical in the way that we approached it, and some things don't change. Whilst the trigger points, as we've said, were quite different, a lot of the aspects and the results were yeah, very it, similar it, it to the GFC very predictable. and how things would potentially play out, mm. which is what we have to Yeah, know. and this is a predictability market. And I think you can find predictability in most markets if you have experience and know what indicators can show predictability and what are outliers. And, and a lot of people get that wrong. And I think sort of, you know, going back to the GC, what, the process of learning through that market, no doubt you're drawing on it quite a lot today. But, you know, to summarise what you guys just spoke about there, it's um, hindsight is a valuable thing because you can only then go back and look at what you couldn't have done uh, differently. But but what you've spoken about there is your ability to build a portfolio out over time by being proactive, but at the same time protecting what you currently have. And no doubt in this environment, a lot of property investors are thinking about that as in, Yes, there are opportunities in this market, but where are those opportunities? So you need to get on the front foot and try and realise those opportunities, but you don't want to do it to detriment to what you currently have. So the dichotomy, the marriage between defence and offence. So how do you defend what you got and how do you build on that by going out there doing it? So as we're sort of gearing up and moving into Christmas in a market which is we know is in considerable amount of flux, but I think there's a lot of clarity in that market as well if you know we're looking at it. What I want to get into today is what should you be doing, Victor mm-hmm. and Steve, as you run up into Christmas when you think about how do I defend what I've got? So 2021 is going to be good for me, but what do I need to be doing to make sure I'm on the front foot in front of other people to capitalise in this market? I don't know where to start. You've got to start with a defence, don't you, Steve? For me, it is yeah, because that allows me to sleep at night, protect what you have and be in a situation where you can execute opportunities when they present themselves. And that's always around cash flow and finance. Mm. And that cash flow will always is not just around what the banks will give you. It's around what you know you can afford. And there's quite a difference there. So it's about your own household budgets. I just want to go back to something that you said a minute ago around a market in flux. And on the surface, I think it could be perceived that it is a market in flux, but I think it's very clear for us. There's the clarity around the market for us at the moment is crystal clear. Mm. If you know where to look and how you can dissect each attribute of the market and where it's been and where it's going to go. That's my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that this year has been different to every other year given COVID. So we need to overlay that in terms of where the data is leading us because It could be that the data is abnormal because of COVID, right? So you can't just rely purely on data more than ever this year as opposed to any other year. You need to overlay that with ground truth and see what the transient changes are happening in each area. And also look at the strongest driver for your portfolio, which is your ability to drive an income. If your job's shaky, perhaps you need to take stock and say, okay, what do I do next in terms of rather than leaving things till too late, Perhaps now's the time to restructure your mortgages. Perhaps now's the time to look at your expenditure, your budgets and all that sort of stuff before it becomes too late. If you don't have the finance, you can't take advantage Mm. at the end of the day. I mean, it's all great to have an idea and say, well, I want to buy this year, next year, whatever it may be. But if you don't take the necessary steps now to put yourself in that position, brackets, finance, you'll always be chasing your tail, but if we come back from the defensive point of view, the finance will actually help you mm-hmm. 
build that defendable position because you'll know exactly where you stand. And whilst on the surface that might say, well, you should know where you stand as an investor, mm. let me tell you the amount of people that we sit with that perhaps could be tighter in terms of their overall portfolio or their budgetary positions is amazing. Like you really don't know where you stand until you run the numbers delicately. Yeah, and this is one of the main reasons we do our reviews with our clients is to constantly tweak and look at the figures, look at all the moving parts in a portfolio, right? Most people, when they're looking at investing, they come in with the thought that I'll buy a property and look after itself. Mm. It'll only look after itself when you look after it. Yeah, and that's something that we should never forget with property. And of course, the more properties you have, the more admin work you have. The bigger the job it is. That's Mm. right, yeah. A um, bit of homework for you guys, and I'll look forward to this. And we won't do this next episode, but maybe one in the early New Year, Victor. I don't know if you've read it before, The Art of War. I've only just really thinking about this, which is a general philosophizer around how to be effective in in battle, essentially. Mm -hmm. A lot of it defensively driven, but defense giving you the capabilities for offense. And I don't think anyone's ever done a parallel between how that would work in property markets. I think we would have a lot of fun taking um, some of those philosophies, which are pretty simple to understand, from that and overlay it with property markets mm-hmm. and, and tactics and the tactical, the strategies and the tactics to do well in property. I think let's do that. Uh, so, as you're saying, that really, was- really quite good. I think it'd be really interesting because yeah. there's some snapshot philosophies you can take across the different chapters and do that. There's my next book or the first book. <laughs> <laughs> the art. It could of, be your book. You the can art have that. of war. Yeah. <laughs> Brackets property investing, but the, the art of property. But sometimes, as the expression goes, the best form of defense is offense. Mm. But you can only do that when you know where you stand. You just can't mm. run into it eyes wide shut yeah and think something will stick and get you out of trouble but mm-hmm. the you know the get out stakes race well, well the key thing of, of that particular narrative in the art of war is defense is critical for being effective in offense but there's when you do apply an offensive strategy there is ways to do it to be most effective and having sort of read it many years ago there is so many learnings there for property markets so your defense over offense would you say your sort of more, lean towards more of an offensive strategy and by doing that, the defensive side of things typically looks after itself, Victor? It is much for muchness really, right? Mm. So regardless mm. of whether you are defense first, offense next or offense first, defense next, you need to know where you're starting off from. And that's where most people get it wrong is that they're trying to take a strategy or take advantage of a market, but you've got to make sure that you know where, you, where you're starting off from so that you know you can track your performance you can also map out your strategies far better and you can also look in the right areas, right? Just because everyone's buying, say, in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane doesn't mean that your portfolio actually suits it. Yep, and that's true. And just so we're clear, defence doesn't mean parking yourself in a corner mm. and defending that position. Well, let's break it down. Let's start with defence. So defence isn't doing nothing. No, defence is around knowing your position, as Vic said. It's about knowing what your capacities, your thresholds are. But it's also in our or within our realm, it's around cash flow. Mm. I don't care what anybody says, the world revolves around cash flow. And whether you want credit, you need cash flow. Whether you want to survive, you need cash flow. doesn't mean that it's the root of all evil because money takes on the persona of the person that has it. It's what you do with it. And you can't be offensive until you know what that particular character point mm. is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things that you need to look at, talking from a defense point of view is that you really need to look in in today's market and this is where most people go wrong is because the interest rates are so low and like as an example Westpac brought out a 1.95 four years fixed Mm. insane insane i have never seen that in my years of investing Mm. did you get a piece of that uh, next question yeah <laughs> <laughs> no uh, is the short answer but I don't I, think I, many I'd like, people will I'd like to remind you Steve that you've got a 4.99 hanging around still yes, uh, yes, yes, I've got so. a few of them <laughs> yes I do <laughs> uh, so uh, coming back to today's money and how cheap it is right this is a recipe for disaster that's going to likely happen in perhaps four or five years time mm. particularly for the first time investors and first home buyers where they're stretching themselves to the red line because they're only doing their sums at two, two and a half percent interest rate. And the reality of it is that more than likely, 
And actually, no, actually, I'll, I'll go out on a limb. I'll give you a hundred percent guarantee that the interest rates within the next decade will go up double than what it is right now. So four and a half, five percent, right? I don't think I can go wrong with that. With that guarantee, it's no, pretty safe. It's <laughs> a very safe bet, right? So, yeah. Victor, when are we going to be talking about the crisis facing Australian investors saying, "Well, when everyone got to the market back when money was one point nine odd percent, uh, my, you know, going, oh, we told you so.' Yeah. Do you, you know, know what? Four, I, four to five years in yeah. my mind. I love that because the cliff. Because mm-hmm. the, the last cliff was. All of um, interest-only stuff. All, oh, all, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, the cliff before the last cliff, right, before yeah. the JobKeeper cliff was everyone's interest-only loans are going to reset at principal and interest and everyone's going to be stuffed because you just couldn't call them and go, hey, can I just stay on interest only? And with, they go, yeah, no worries. With that <laughs> voice. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a good point because there's always a crisis. Mm. Yeah, there was that interest rate, P&I rollover scenario, but mm. then there was an APRA. Mm-hmm. Um, crisis. Then there was the election. Then there was the pandemic. Yeah, there was a. You know There's yeah. always a crisis somewhere. So this is why you should start, as you mean, to continue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's always important to have that. I want to bring it back to the defence scenario. It's not about being scared in the corner. It's not about that. It's just knowing where you stand mm-hmm. at all times, because there is always something around the corner, whether it be a crisis or an optimum time. And if we bring that into today's scenario, there's a very good chance that the world will live large mm-hmm. once we get over this for a period of time. Roaring 20s. Victor's well, going to be out there dancing in the streets and- uh- <laughs> <laughs> Prohibition on karma is over. <laughs> Man, that's expensive these days because you can't actually get them in. How, yeah, how yeah. much is karma? So, like it's, um, it's, 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 investing in sites yeah, yeah, is about yeah. all commodities. Yeah, all, if, at, at the height of lockdown, so March, April, May- they were selling for around three hundred and fifty dollars a kilo, and there were people that were selling their stockpile. Was there for, a black market? Uh, there was a there was a strong black market for a powder yeah. that tastes like muddy dam water. Mate, it's liquid gold to us. Don't be like that. Our specific Steve. islanders. Have right? you had it? Yeah, I love it. Rubbish. You liked carver. I don't mind carver. I know it depends. No, it's it I depends on the quality. I don't necessarily. I'm not going to say I crave. You have a cup of carver, right? Cup is that the you right have thing? A bowl. Yeah. A bowl. A bowl. Yeah. I don't necessarily crave a bowl of carver, but I do enjoy the people you normally have it with. And it's, it's quite a- In curious. other words, Steve, what he's saying is he'd rather hang out with me than you. That's what he's saying, really. <laughs> I, I like the cultural experience and, and I like the, um, I guess, the theatre around it as yes. well, right? And yes. That's what I enjoy about it. You'd see the Culturally. same- Culturally. You'd see yeah. a, a theatre on a Friday night down at the pub. <laughs> it's different. It's like, you know, a bunch of blokes sitting around going, oh yeah, can I have a two is new, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I quite like the um, – yeah, the theatre is probably the right word and the uh, the traditions of drinking kava with good people. Yeah, traditions, absolutely. That's yeah, the, that's yeah, the, yeah, steeped yeah. in tradition. Yeah, it yeah. is steeped in tradition, yeah. like a VB. Anyway, we're off a different way. But we digress, right? So buying let's, and selling. Yeah, let's come back to your comment, Steve. It's almost like a version of footy. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> footy commentary. We'll come back to your comment in terms of, you know, there's always going to be a crisis, right? There is a sovereign risk every time you invest because rates could change. Rules can change, tax rules can change. You can have COVID, which is, you could sort of coin as, as a sovereign risk, mm. yeah? But the reality is that when you are facing, when you're at a cliff face or a, a cliff edge, uh, if I may say, it is of your own making because you haven't seen the signs before and picked up the signs and the tells within your portfolio. So if you bring it back to pre-APRA and post-APRA where the um, interest only was t- turning into principal interest, Look at today's market, right? So we've got a, a 1.99 fixed for years. And so in four years' time or five years' time, your rates would then jump back to normal rates, which I would assume would be in the, definitely be more than 1.95 in my opinion, but it also come in as principal and interest. So if you haven't then put strategies in place to how to handle that, that extra requirement of cash flow, you're in trouble. Hence your buffers. And mm. this is the point because- but is that is that being defensive or offensive then? Because there's two ways you could frame that. It, so if, if I'm paying 1.99- point. yeah, That's the point because- I'm being offensive by ensuring that I've got that buffer in place for mm-hmm. a four-year put, whether it's an offset or- Correct. Or you paid at the rate that you would be paying it at. That's being yeah. offensive. Defensive. It, it's thinking, okay. it's looking at the future and once again, preparing. Doing your sums in the worst case scenario, so saying that, okay, can I handle a 4% interest rate? Right, to begin with. Mm. Right. And if I can't, what are the things that I'm putting in place to mitigate that risk? And then also look at it, say, in, uh, let's say your mortgages are going off fixed in four years' time or three years' time. A year before, you start thinking and talking mortgage restructure so that you're then resetting 
the interest only if that's your strategy mm. or re-strategizing to say how am i going to get that extra money whether it is to create more rental income streams or bring forward perhaps like construction of a granny flat to create that extra income to cater for the extra demand in cash flow so you need to be looking at those things proactively investing is not set and forget mm. from that viewpoint because you need to still monitor its performance well it's about being active yeah all the time Mm. not just sitting back on your heels and enjoying this moment in time. But having said that, and it'll be interesting to see, to replay this conversation, let's call it in three to four years' time, Mm -hmm. and see how it all panned out. Nonetheless, we're into a a very exciting time from here forward for at least, well, not at least, but approximately a couple of years, I believe. And we've already seen the conditions of the market start to change and we've already seen growth contrary to what most of the media agencies are talking about. And we're already starting to see the beginnings of a FOMO market. Yes. And if you you track all of the opinion houses and predictor houses and banks, beginning of COVID, they're saying 20, 30, 40% drop in pricing. Slowly, they've adjusted it to now ANZ's actually come out and revised their prediction saying, actually, next year, we'd like to get 9% growth. What did we say? I think we went... Just take it easy, everyone. Just yeah. relax. And I was just about to say that. Go <laughs> yeah. back to however long we've been experiencing COVID and what we've been saying, mm. as well as a few other industry peers as well, mm. where it's just not going to be the way that the reporting agencies are wanting to pound the pavement. It's not going to happen that way. And here's the reasons X, Y, Z, one, two, three, why it won't. Mm. As a general statement, because we're trying to match their general statement as mm. well. And now to see, as you say, ANZ, roll back. I think Westpac had already done that a couple of months before mm-hmm. and from peak to trough, you know, now they're talking 2%. Yeah. Now that's taking into account that some might have fallen 10 or 15%, but that's also conversely, some areas might have gone up 10 to mm-hmm. 15% and we have experienced that Correct. as a side note. But I think as we move forward, and we did mention this a couple of months ago, I think I did a video somewhere and I said, we are starting to see the beginnings of a FOMO market. Mm. And every week that, I don't know, that quantity factor is getting larger and larger and larger. Just on this weekend alone, we were smashed in open houses, nine out of 10 of our open homes, where we were going to buy, not sell, clearly, mm. where we didn't even get a look in. And with se- in one of them, 75 groups through. 75 That's ridiculous. Groups. And out but of that does seven- everyone buy already? Has everyone got like a piece of paper in a back pocket that says, yes, Mr. Tarrant, you've been approved for a mortgage? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but what I am starting to see is more unconditional offers. So if it's New Mm. South Wales, we'll call it a 66W or cash unconditional Mm. in other states. And we saw one, one of our teams sold their house last week. They put it on the market on Monday and they had, I think it was one open home on a Wednesday. And by Friday, they had a 66W uncon offer to 100,000 more than what they were thinking. It's not bad. That's They snap it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you start to ask yourself the question, well, (laughs) hang on. (laughs) Is that price right? Is it price right? Yeah. Yeah. But it was right circumstances, right time. But that is the market today. And we're talking about a $1.5 million mm-hmm. purchase here. This isn't a $300,000 yeah. purchase. So how do you, it's an important point, balance this FOMO market? Because if you want to operate in this market, it means that you've got to operate within uh, the dynamics of that current market. So if you've got a lot of other people up there right now who are potentially driving prices up, inverted commas, unnecessarily, but you want to participate in buying in this market, what do you do? Do you st- Step out, find somewhere else, find a location that people aren't buying in. You know, how do you operate? Both is the short answer to that. Because FOMO doesn't – you don't flick the switch and FOMO has happened and we start to see everyone into a market. It's a gradual process. Mm. And when I say we're starting to see those initial stages, it's from a ground roots level where – Hasn't quite hit the data yet. Yeah, and and it could be something as granular as investor finance starting to tick up a little Mm. bit Mm. through to – open homes and speaking to the agents, is it an owner occupier or is it an investor purchasing and the like. And that will start to get larger and larger and larger until all the media outlets start to change their narrative around the subject, which we're starting to see that. You're seeing it already. Yeah. You're seeing it already. But they can – and I'm thinking about not your specific property media, i.e. smart property investment, which I like Mm. to think is reasonably informed. I'm talking about your – your more consumer-based media, which we'll talk about so fashion, then then The Voice, and then 
property, right? Like one yeah. day they'll say, there's blood on the streets. Next day they'll say, look at this property bazillionaire. Then mm. the next day it's, look at this blood on the streets. And then it's another property bazillionaire who's mm. made, you know, you can't, you've got to be very careful where you, we've spoken about this at length, you go and check it about it, where to digest uh, your information. To digest your information. Mm. But there's a point that you made, Victor, a little bit earlier on that the last six months, and I guess a step backwards, we were chatting about lessons through the GFC and learnings from history and, and using that information and that experience to apply into the future, both offensively and defensively. You mentioned the six months past and how that will shape into 2021. How much difference is it going to make that we've gone through this COVID environment when it comes to approaching investing in property in 2021? Well, if people start pursuing the Fed Mm. uh, in terms of which areas are just absolutely spiking with growth and rental yield, perhaps they may get hurt if they don't take the COVID filter off. So a good example of that would be, say, Perth where a lot of people are starting to jump into that market because the rents are very, very good mm. over there. But we need to make sure that you know the rent is not transient in that sense because the fly-in, fly-outs can't get out of Perth, uh, out of WA, and therefore they are choosing to rent there, which has led to increase in demand. Right, So you need to take that away and look at the normal fundamentals for that area. And um, listeners in our podcast would recognize that Steve and I have been investigating Perth for now almost three years, and it's only last year that we started buying there in some decent volume. So we know what the general rental market is there, and we can then keep people safe. So that's something that you need to be mindful of before you start. The other thing is one of the opportunities as well as crisis that's looming up is in March next year, which you need to prepare for, which is a flip over from responsible lending to responsible borrowing. Okay, let's chat about that because a lot of people might not be familiar. They might have heard of the term, but they might not be familiar with what it is Mm -hmm. and what's happening. So let's get into that, mate. Yeah. So in March, basically the um, banks, the restriction that APRA has put on in terms of bank lending will be eased right out, right? Now that's the word in the street at the moment. But if you look at it just purely from One of the qualifiers, and one of the qualifiers is that currently the banks are using your actual household expenditure as a measure to say, okay, this is how much you spend, so therefore this is how much you've got left over, and therefore this is how much we can let you borrow. And for someone that today is able to qualify for 500,000 as an example, in March is likely to qualify for 570 to 600,000 because what they're going to bring in is the average household expenditure figure, which is, uh, if memory serves me right, about $450 a week. So right now, if you're earning a higher income, the bank is looking at it and saying you are also spending a lot more, so therefore you actually can't borrow as much because of your expenditure pattern. So that will then change where the owners then comes back onto the borrower. That's why I'm saying it'll be a responsible borrowing rather than responsible lending. The banks will still have to do their compliance, but it'll become far easier and uh, to borrow money. Plus, also, you'll be able to borrow a lot more money at that point in time. So running in parallel with this is changes to mortgage broker regulation yes. as well. Do you want to yep. tell us about that? So this is where the best interest duty, best interest duty is. Uh, it comes into play in 1st of January, where the broker then has to assess whether it is financially safe for you to borrow that mm-hmm. amount of money. But it still comes back to the information you, the borrower, uh, are putting in front of the broker. Because if you're not disclosing disclosing stuff or if you are not telling the broker of imminent changes happening in your income, that's how far the broker can go, right? So it still comes back to you as the borrower. And mm-hmm. this goes back to the beginning of the conversation around the subject, and, mm-hmm. and that is preparation. Yes. So if you are looking to borrow in three months' time, you actually need to start that process now, now. in terms of getting your house in order, yeah. whether it be expenditure patterns, bank accounts, mm-hmm. direct debits, whatever it may be, personal non-productive debt, you need to move now and morph now and make those strategic yeah. moves now so that it gives you a better chance. Yeah, because there's open banking say. now. There's the open sense, banking, yeah. correct. Mm. There's another thing, open banking is yeah. another term that most people might That's not be right, familiar yeah. with. So this is where, so if we go back to, say, five years ago, most banks would not know what accounts you had open. Mm. Right. So there are a lot of unscrupulous borrowers out there, if I may say so, and perhaps brokers out there that fudged the numbers and I allowed you to qualify for more. So now with open banking, any lender can see which accounts you have got 
operational and open. So I'm talking about loans, mm. right? And any defaults and all that is clearly visible for them. So it's a lot harder, and I think it is far better now from a responsibility point of view uh, and keeping people safe point of view that the banks have full vision for that, and which is comes right back to. Um, Steve's comment, you need to clean up house now. So if you've got, uh, you know, credit cards there that are sitting there that have never been used and all that, close them down. Close them down. So that the bank can actually take into account that you don't have that card because from a bank's point of view, you've got the ability to draw down that money at any point in time if because you've got an open account there. So all of those things need to be cleared away so that you, when you come into next year, You've got a clean slate and you're working within the rules of the bank to make things easier for you and therefore qualify with a larger panel of lenders. As March rolls in, there'd be a bigger rush of people jumping in that couldn't qualify for couple of years because of APRA and all that. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know, releasing the floodgates. Yeah. So a good broker should be able to help you out with all this Absolutely. stuff, right? Pretty yeah. much going... Cut, get rid of that, pay off your credit card, consolidate this debt, refinance a bit of this, clean up mm. your stuff. Like, that is a real good broker it's, job. But it's a lot of lead-up work. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. they often refer to that as scenarios. And mm. so, like, I know the guys over at MLS Finance. Yes. They've been busier than they have been in years because of that pre-workload, mm-hmm. if you will, mm. to get an, a deal across the line. Yeah. And gone are the days of, you know, you rock up to a broker or to a bank and, you know, you get a loan within two, three days. Yeah. Right? Possible for, if I may say, clean skins, you know, so yeah. <laughs> if you haven't got many uh, credit facilities. Yeah. But for most people- it's For us, it's pretty hard to get a mortgage. It's pretty hard, yes. Yeah. So the, yeah. the larger your portfolio, the longer it'll take. For uh, you know, all three of us, I suppose it's a six-month process, if that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm due to settle one in a couple of weeks. <laughs> you got your finance order, yeah? So finance, finance is taking a long time. Finance is slow at the moment, right? Particularly yeah. if you are a- inverted commas, more sophisticated investor, someone with multiple multiple properties in a portfolio? It is, 100% it is. And there's a few reasons for that. One is obviously the load as the, the lending institution scale back mm. their workers because of COVID, yep. you know, whether it be overseas and back-end stuff. So there is a lag period there. And mm. I would probably suggest that it will stay that way and maybe get a little easier over the next couple of mm-hmm. months until we get back into some realm of normality. But if we can just go, I just want to go back to the whole Christmas period thing for a minute, because mm. whilst we're talking about being defensive, it's just to be able to put us into a position once again to be offensive. But there's some steps that we suggest that the listener take so that they are in that position. And the first one is all about income. So if you're an existing at this time of the year, forget COVID, but at this time of the year, if you're an investor and you have one, two, 100 properties, whatever it may be, you really want to be making sure that none of your leases are coming off their lease period. Which I have. We've been shutting about Yeah, this. we have been. It's a nightmare. My golden rule mm. for myself is I don't want any leases ending from November through to the end of January. Look, if you've got a property that's coming vacant now, don't do a 12-month lease. Do a six or eight-month lease. Yeah, so stage the, mm. the so end re- lease period. reset it. Yep. So then you... Then you sort of have a renewal in May or June and then do a, a year. Correct. Mm. Then. Yep. Okay. And But even even that aside, because of the buoyancy of some rental markets, I would be suggesting that you take a very strong look at how long you want that lease period mm-hmm. to be. So if I take uh, one of my properties as an example, this morning I put the lease in for six months. Mm. It starts in January, but I wanted it to end just after June because the market is perpetuating so quickly in terms of its vac- or its rental value – I wanted to take advantage of that. So I don't want to be locked in at 12 months. Now, that's quite a deliberate decision on my behalf, but you need to have that ground truth knowledge as to know what's going on. If you're resetting a lease, and this is getting really technical, but you normally pay a week's- Usually half a week. Half depends, a week. Depends, depends, depends on, on the- Because you six months or a year, it's still the same amount of money. So it's less effective from an income point of view to do a short lease from a upfront. It depends. Upfront. On, it depends, the, yeah, it depends on, the on what you've negotiated to okay. begin with. So typically- when they re-sign a tenant for a, another 12 months, it's a week plus GST or a week and a half plus GST mm. of rent as the fee. And some agents, if you do it for six months, would be the same, but I'm always of the opinion it's no. So you can uh, negotiate on this stuff. Everything again, is negotiable. Yeah. Even a uh, a Big Mac meal. <laughs> oh, what's a Whopper? What's a Hungry Jack's meal? I don't know. <laughs> Where you do most of your business. <laughs> I can see you haggling for an extra large uh, large chips on the side. But, get, a free, uh, get a free drink. No, he just, how, how, do, how do you guys do it? Like, Let's have a chat about this because you do all day, every day you negotiate, right? 
Yeah, we stuff. do it unconsciously now. We do it unconsciously. Like, do you negotiate yeah. for everything? Because so I, I negotiate for everything. Yeah. If, if, Absolutely. Like, you know, I, I got myself. You know, we we're talking about potato scallops before. Mm. I got myself three or four free scallops the other night, right? Just for a bit of bit of charm. So it's not about what you pay; it's about the value add. Yeah. Yes. So that's yeah. so don't ever get caught up on price. Sometimes it might be terms and conditions. Yes, it's another whole podcast we can mm-hmm. have a chat about. So, Victor, your attitude towards considering your skills and experience and buying through the GFC in this market right now. Are mm. you a happy Victor Kumar? Are you got a bit of a spring spring in your step? You're I'm not, turning uh, I'm turning cartwheels at the moment. You yeah. should see yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're sort of shaking there. It's like yeah. 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 So we were talking about finance and Christmas, mm. right? One of the things that most people perhaps don't understand is that most banks, as we get closer to Christmas, do put an embargo on refinances. So they give the priority to purchases, right? So if you are restructuring your mortgages, you need to pull your trigger really early and get your application in. As it gets closer to Christmas, your refinance gets pushed to the back. So let's say you're planning to buy. Why? Because they want the purchases to settle because it's got a uh, timestamp on it, right? So, you know, 42 days, 35 days, that's so okay. forth, right? So because of nothing happens during that period of Christmas. Correct. Yeah, okay. the contract. Right. So it's a resourcing yep. thing. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Particularly in terms of purchases because solicitors are away Christmas mm. to, say, mid-January. Uh, but in refinance, they can come back to it, right? So if your purchase is dependent, let's say you're planning to purchase in January and your purchase is totally dependent on a refinance, you need to pull your trigger really early and get in touch with the broker and perhaps put your applications in well before December to have any chance of it settling in January. That's really important. And Stephen, an offensive strategy, opportunity, capitalization over the Christmas period, is it a good time to buy? Outside of the fact of finance might be hard because of resourcing and stuff, can you get good bargains if they exist? Traditionally, it's always been a great time to purchase because most people are on holidays between Mm. their ears, yet sellers still want a result. So sellers still want to sell. Over the last couple of years, however, it's been quite a switch where everybody thinks the same thing. So there's Mm. a lot of buyers in the market. This year may be a little different, however, because of the circumstances that you know, worldwide we are in. And as people can't travel overseas, that they might spend largely internally mm-hmm. and domestically. It'd be interesting to see when they come back from Christmas holidays, how they feel about life, how much they've loaded up their credit cards, their personal loans and, and use the whatever's left in their bank accounts, so to speak, in combination with the March job keeper. Yep cessation and whether they think, well, you know, should we now sell? Mm -hmm. I don't think there'll be a volume of distressed selling. However, we might start, and it's only a might, we might start to see a little larger volume of listings on the market. So just a few more than what we have today because we're still off very, very low levels. Mm -hmm. However, even if we do see an increased volumes of listings, I think people will come back from the holidays the other side of the coin, if you will, being buyers, renewed with energy yeah, and want to get into a market with the general New Year's resolutions and mm-hmm. wealth creation. And so that will equal itself out. Mm-hmm. So it's about, once again, preparation and being in a position to act because I think the good opportunities will present themselves, but the good opportunities will go fast. Yeah. So if you hold approvals in your hand, you've got a advantage over someone that's not prepared, especially going into Christmas and into the new year. It's really important that you get your pre-approvals in place so that you can capitalise on the market and the opportunities that may come along. Mm. And a benefit for those who have stuck with us through 40 minutes of this particular podcast, where do you like at the moment, Steve? Where are you guys lurking around and assessing opportunities? It's interesting, you know, that Last night I was reading someone else's report around vacancy rates. Mm. In this particular instance, it was New South Wales or Sydney-centric, to be accurate. And speaking of accuracy, the numbers that they were perpetuating, which came off one of the data collection warehouses, was massively inaccurate. From the reality reality. of what's going on. So they're they're basing their numbers on data, which is old, versus what you're seeing on the ground. So to be fair, though, I'd say 50% was accurate. And the other 50% was grossly inaccurate. Okay. And the vacancy rates they were perpetuating were circa somewhere between 4 and 5%. Mm. Um, and it just isn't that. It's probably around 3 And then other areas it was around 3% when I know for a fact that it's less than 1%. Mm. 
Now, that gives a, an opportunity to people that actually know that piece of ground truth because it will eventually start to report that it is that low. But the time that happens, you're going to have a lot of other people in the market trying to jump on that bandwagon. So it's it's about, once again, getting in so early. So that's a benefit of information, like actual intelligence, <clears throat> which just isn't what everyone else has access to. Yep. You and need to go out. It's human intelligence. Yeah, or ground truth. As ground we, truth. Yeah, so, but that's the same in, in just about every market or every state and territory of Australia that we're seeing at mm. the moment. There is a an element of confidence in the market that has not been there for many, many years. years. And that's from a whole of Australia point of view. And that's not just from a people wanting to purchase, but it's people that are seeing that there's a sweet spot or this inflection point that we've been talking about for the last 18 months mm -hmm. between supply and demand that has mm -hmm. now come to fruition. And as a result of that, our rents are starting to perpetuate. And from that, as we've talked about, the commercial element of residential real estate will start to see price growth on top of organic growth, if you will. So very, very interesting times ahead, in our opinion. I think there are some areas, well, not I think, there are some areas that we steer very well clear of because I think there's, there will be hurt and that's, to be fair, that's what's dragging the general data down. But there are areas- And of, this is the stuff you're mainly reading about in the papers. Correct. Mm. But there are areas there that we have seen 10% easy growth during this pandemic. Free pass. Free pass growth. Yeah. Well, it exists. But just the fundamentals through, are there. Smart you, buying. Yeah. Well, no, I, I think it's there's an element of organic there because the writing was on the wall 18 months ago Yeah, mm. that it was going to happen. And it might have even been an element where the pandemic has accentuated that point mm. in terms of a lack of supply. Because let's not forget, construction numbers are the lowest they've been in many, many years. True. Construction finance, DA approvals, the lowest it's been in many, many years. Mm. And yet we still have this undersupplied issue throughout a lot of areas of Australia. What happens when the international borders open? Who knows? In at the same time that the vaccine is rolled out, which mm -hmm. they're now starting to talk about, has a 90% effective rate. 96 is a new one, 96% yeah. effectiveness rate. Now, one thing that is the elephant in the general economy room is I think we need to learn to live with COVID, whether you believe it or not. There will mm. be infection rates that keep, we'll have nothing. And then look, South Australia, as of today's recording, well, it's jumped again. And I think that will be the norm until we get it completely under control. And as a, as a result of that, you'll start to see the consumer confidence indexes ebb and flow with infection rates, yeah. which is you know, another point. All the banks' confidence indexes have gone up dramatically. In mm. some cases, it's well, one of the banks, it's the highest in three years, but the norm is about seven months. That's a, And that's a direct reflection of what is happening between people's ears in the economy yeah. in the last month, okay. current data. Good. Good insight, Steve. Um, Victor, what's happening in your neck of the walls? What are you guys up to as you gear up for Christmas? Uh, no doubt it's a busy time of the year for you and a lot of people probably calling you up going, mm -hmm. I want to get this sorted out before the end of Christmas, before Christmas starts. Um, anything interesting that you need to let us know about? Uh, look, we, we are doing our Facebook Lives. Um, mm. And uh, you know, so if you haven't already liked our page or followed our Facebook page, do that so that you can be notified whenever we go live. Uh, and also, if you wanted to discuss how you can take advantage of today's market to further your portfolio, reach us to us on Facebook or send us a email questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. You do get to sit down with either myself or Steve, so you're speaking with us directly, and we'll assess where you are right now. And based on what you are trying to achieve, we will map out a plan for you so that you've got a clear map and clear guidelines as to how to get into 2021 and take advantage of the market as it is. Very good. Well, thanks, uh, gents. I always do enjoy it. We've covered a lot of ground there. But I wanted to – I know, you, are you a big reader, Steve? Like, do you like reading books and stuff or are you more of a YouTube uh, watcher to get your information? No, he doesn't He doesn't read it for the articles. It's for the pictures, okay. no, for the photos. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a um – I'm a YouTuber. Okay. YouTuber from way well, back. What do you think? I think what we need to do for next year. But I do read. Like I read. Yeah. I read quite a lot, or I listen to the audio books if I can find some. If you find it. I, I want to. I want to start breaking DC down voice. some of the classics, Victor. I think for 2021, mm -hmm. some of the classics of literature, and apply it to property markets. I want to start with the art of war, and then I mm -hmm. want to go through some of the other stuff, even if it's just a little bit. 
Should we the, not be speaking to the authors and the, the I don't know, what do you like, mate, the production they're company? They're all dead, mate. Yeah, I know, but I just don't want to be caught. <laughs> oh, you need to pay royalties. <laughs> <laughs> no, even if it's just a little a little part of um, of every podcast we do, I think we can learn a lot of stuff from, from Can we not classics. shortcut the process and just go straight to you, that, seeing that you've read all these books, just give us something, Phil? No. I'll, I'll, I'll pose the- um, Maybe he hasn't read the I'll, book. I'll pose the, I'll pose yeah. the learnings. You've got to tell me what your thoughts are to it. That's what we're going to do moving forward. I'll enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Don't worry, it'll be good. Sounds like a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can get a Happy Meal menu and say, oh, well, what is it? What, why do you got to mix some fries with a cheeseburger? And, a, and, and a <laughs> I'm sure you can give us something out of that. Anyway, we digress. We're going to do that. At least try it. I think it's going to be good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time. And uh, that's Investing Insights, the Right Product Group. Hope you've enjoyed that. Please, uh, one favour from us. Uh, we all do like getting together, having a chat, but uh, the whole Right Property Group team uh, get a big kick out of the feedback that we're getting on the podcast. So wherever you're listening to this right now, if you can please leave a review. If you think we're worth five stars, maybe the other guys rate them. They're worth five stars, maybe not me. And a bit of a comment, we do get a, a real kick out of uh, reviewing those. So, yeah, if you can do that for me, they're a real good favour to me. Uh, we'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.